Praise God. Well, I'm excited tonight. We got a, I, I, want to, I want to finish up a word, you know, a, 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 I guess about a week ago or so, a couple of days before New Year's, maybe. Felt like the Lord put on my heart. I ended up in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, if we're going to be working tonight, we'll probably maybe use the ESV version if you want to load that up. But uh, he put, I ended up in Hebrews 12, and I felt as though the Lord wanted me to share that message. And then the more I studied it, last week we went backwards and we went to Hebrews chapter 11, if you'll remember that. And we preached Hebrews 11 and then the first part of Hebrews chapter 12. And in Hebrews 11, that chapter is really what you'd call the, the hall of fame, if you will, or the heroes of faith. Amen. A lot of people have a cloud of witnesses is the way the scripture describes it has gone before us. And just to remind you, just a couple of the names, it said that by faith, Enoch was translated and that he did not see death. And he had this testimony that he pleased God. Amen. And one of, one of the things that has really stuck out to me as I've thought about these people is that each one of them in their time frame, they made a decision to not live like the rest of the world was living around them. They made a decision to separate themselves from the wickedness of the world that was around them and to choose to make the choice to live for God. They believed God by faith that he had a plan and that his word was true and they yoked themselves to the things of God and God was pleased with them because of their faith. And you know, if you think about Enoch, he lived in the pre-flood stage. And, and we're not going to get into the details of all that right now, but let me say this. The Lord saw that the, wor that the world was full of wickedness and that the thoughts of men were evil continually. And he destroyed the earth with a flood, yet Enoch found was pleasing in the eyes of God because he walked with God. That's, that's a big deal, friend. That's a big deal to, to know that, that there's people that have chosen to live for God. See, God is looking for people that are willing to choose to live for him and to separate themselves from the world. And let me say this, it's so important in the day that we live in, because in the day that we live in, much of the church has found itself in the midst of compromise. And we really shouldn't be surprised by that. We really should be very aware of that if we're Bible readers, if we're Bible studiers. The apostle Paul warned us that these things were going to happen. Amen. He said that in the last days, people would depart from the faith, that they would give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Yes. Amen. And that and, and that the, the love of many would wax, would, would wax or grow cold for the things of God. Amen. And so so that was Enoch's testimony. Look, look, but Abraham, it says by faith, Abraham, he obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. You, the word inheritance has really been on my mind all day long. I didn't know really. I thought I was going to like warm up and preach this to the prisoners when I went to Centerville this morning. Like to kind of go over this and talk to them about inheritance. The Lord completely transformed the whole thing. But what did come forth was inheritance. And because, because you see God has an inheritance for each and every human being that has ever breathed oxygen into their lungs. But the reality of it is, is that most people will not receive their inheritance. Most people will not walk in the purpose that God had planned for them. And the reason that I know that to be true is because the word of God tells us that wide is the pathway that ends up leading to destruction and narrow. That there's very few people that are really going to make it into glory. We, and that's another thing that's been very sobering to me over the last couple of weeks. I've really been thinking about that passage of scripture. I don't know what that means to you, but I'm telling you right now, I'm, my little heart's getting Getting real sobered up here lately because I'm telling you right now the scripture says that there's all, there's not going to be a multitude upon a multitude that's going to make it in and I'm concerned that many times we become complacent now look you're either saved or you're not praise God you're either in or you're out there's not like a, a little bit yeah, I mean, your rewards might get burned up. I don't want that to happen to me either, by the way. I don't want my rewards to get burned up. I want my rewards to last. But if you're not doing anything for the Lord, let me just go ahead. That's right. If you didn't know, I'm the rowdy preacher, okay? But if you're not doing anything for the Lord, do not expect to be upset when you stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and you do not hear the words you wanted to hear when you did not use the gifts, the talents, Amen. And or you did not yield yourself to the king of kings and you did not live your life for him. 
Listen, it was about right here last year when I was praying and the Holy Spirit told me before I walked. Oh, by the way, I'm going to walk the cross again for Mardi Gras. I'm trying to recruit a couple couple people that will be willing to come. If you're not willing to come, at least pray for me while I do I'm doing it again, even if I'm by myself. I'm telling you right now, I'm doing it. I'm going to get some tracks made. Last year was amazing. Last year was absolutely amazing. I'm telling you. Anyway, I was praying and the Holy Spirit began to sh share with my heart. He said this. No longer will the words, I love you, I love you, work for me. I want my people to serve me. And that was the anthem that I brought out there to the streets with me. And every, every time I turned around when I would go to go speak to somebody, they're hiding their stuff and they're like, but I love the Lord. I don't question whether you love the Lord. I don't mean to be ugly. I don't mean to listen to me. If you know me, you know I love souls. Okay, I might hear, oh, he doesn't sound like he loves. No, no, I love souls. That's why I'm going to stand up here and tell the truth of what I read in the scripture. And I'm here to tell you right now that hell is going to be filled with people that love God and filled with people that God so sure enough loved. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And there's a whole lot of people that say they love him. But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But I got good news for you. This is not a word. Don't try to keep his commandments in your flesh. Because that's not going to work. We're about to launch into some more Roman stuff over in the next few weeks. Because pe the people of God need to understand that what Jesus did at the cross that didn't only just save you. But what Jesus did at the cross gives you access to the grace and the power of God. Amen. To, to empower you to live a life of victory. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus, the scripture says in Colossians chapter 2 that what Jesus did at the cross defeated the powers of darkness Amen. And Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. The Lord has given us power and authority to live in victory so that we can do and accomplish the mission that he has called us to accomplish. He's called us to, to reproduce after our own kind. He has called us to be witnesses for the kingdom of God. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes, sometimes we're witnesses to our children. We're teaching our children, but we should be witnesses to the people we work with. We should be we should be there for brothers and sisters in the Lord. Come on, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. We should be there for one another. Yeah. We should be so sensitive to the presence of the Holy Spirit that when the enemy tries to slither in to this garden called our heart, we should be able to notice immediately when he shows up on the scene. Come on, help me out here. If the Holy Spirit speaking to you, the moment look. Look, when you got on the phone with the wrong person and said the first wrong word, the Holy Spirit started dealing with your heart. And if you don't feel it now, it's probably because you entertained it too long. Yeah, right. And you're playing games, and the conscience can become seared. This ain't in my notes. I'm just saying. Somebody needs to hear it. Yeah. Amen. And so look, when, when as soon as you start to feel that right there, you don't want to destroy that feeling. It's very precious. Because you'll sit there and you'll think that you're okay when in reality you're not. Because the conscience yeah. can become seared. And this heart is such an important place for the Lord. It, it's so important. He, he, it's, the scripture says to sanctify the Lord Jesus in your heart. The Lord wants his special spot right here. It belongs to him. Amen. And he doesn't want to share it with anything or anyone else. He wants it all to be for him. And whenever you give that spot to him, then everything else starts to line up, my friend. Amen. Relationships at the house start to look better. Praise God. Relationships in the workplace start to look better. Amen. Praise God. So Abraham was looking. It was an inheritance. I went off. <laughs> but the inheritance was is that the inheritance, the, the enemy is trying to steal everybody's inheritance. Amen. He is. He wants to steal people's inheritance. And you know, one of the things that I'll say too is this. I said it once again, but it's so profound to me. That this concept, I've been talking to this, and y'all heard me say it, but I can't get it out of my head. That God created this earthly realm for physical creatures to live upon it. This place does not belong to the devil. You hear what I'm trying to say? This rock called earth was not created for the devil to have power upon it. Yet Jesus says he has power. And the devil said in Luke chapter 4, I have these kingdoms belong to me in all their glory because they have been delivered to me and I will give them to whom I will. Well, how did you get it? Through disobedience. 
Through disobedience of the first man, Adam, he gained power and control. But through the last Adam, Jesus, we have been given back our power and our authority and our dominion in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And we need to get our minds right. We need to get our minds lined up to who we are in Christ. We have a new identity. We are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And we need to begin to believe God according to his word and watch God use us and work in us and work through us. Amen. Amen. So there's an inheritance. And God's taking it back is my point. He called Abraham. He said, come out of your father's house and I'm going to make you a nation. And I'm going to bless those who curse you and, and curse those who, who I'm, I'm going to bless the, I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. A prophetic promise given in 2000 BC that was manifest when Jesus the Christ was born from the lineage of Abraham. Listen, he, he caused, called a man out who never saw the promise. And then at, at some point in time, the, the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River and they were given that little sliver of land right there. And, and look, th this whole earth belongs to God. God created it. You know, I was driving down the road about a year ago, I can remember, and I'm just worshiping the Lord. And I'm like, Lord, sometimes I just feel like I go off in public places. I just start talking to people about you. And it just gets, and sometimes I don't know. I wonder if it's out of hand. Don't, he said, don't you apologize. And he, he said, this place belongs to me, son. This earth belongs to me. And don't you apologize for it. And look, you know what the Lord's doing? I'm taking it back. I'm taking it back one piece at a time. This is the plan of God, child of God. This is the word of God. Amen. That he called a man named Abraham out and he gave him a sliver, a little piece of land. For what? For the purpose of giving birth to Messiah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Through the nation of Israel, he gave birth to the anointed one. And through the anointed one, he's created a new family that stretches across the globe. He's taking it back one step at a time. And listen, if I get through this message, I want you to know he's got a plan to bring it forward into the next stage. It is, this, this is a temporary state of mind. This is a temporary moment. This is, literally, Ray Mayo said, this is a dress rehearsal for eternity. You have a chance to have a dress rehearsal and to get it right. Listen, this is very important, Christian. And I'm telling you right now, I can't, it's not going to get any better than this. This is how it's probably going to be for the rest of my life. Because as I was praying here recently again, <laughs> the Lord, out of my spirit, and I know y'all heard me say it, but I'm going to say it again. Out of my spirit, I said, Lord, I've always prayed. Let me hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. But then it said, and Lord, help me to help your people to also hear those words. That is a very, very powerful responsibility. But listen to me. If you don't know the word of God, if I don't preach the word of God, and if you don't get the word of God somewhere else, because it doesn't have to be in this church. There's other people, I'm sure, that are preaching it. But if you do not get a hold of the word of God, you will not be able to hear those words because you won't even know what he's looking for. And that's the problem that we have in the modern church. People want everything but the word. They want a production. They want entertainment. Come on. Come on. And they, 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 they want their social gatherings. They want their social friendships. And there's nothing wrong with friendships. And there's nothing wrong with, with being excellent for the Lord. Because the Lord deserves excellence. But there's a difference between entertainment and worship, my friend. Because listen, entertainment is all about you. Entertainment's all about you. And you get what you get want. And, and you get your own going to get my blessing. Hallelujah. And you will get blessed. You will get blessed. But listen, it's not about you. It's about him. And if we will come together and worship him, he deserves the glory. Church, I don't know how bad your day was today, but he deserves the glory. And when we come into the house and we exalt his name and we worship him, I promise you, if you will make a connection from your heart to the king of kings, you will receive a blessing. He will reciprocate. He will show up and pour his spirit into you. He will heal you. He will give promises. He will fulfill his promises in your life. I believe that. Because you were created to give him glory. So Abraham went out. He didn't even know where he was going. You know what it says? It says he was looking forward to a city whose foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He, so he was looking for a different. Enoch wasn't looking to live in the world. Abraham went out looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. That means he wasn't looking. I know I said this last week probably. That means he wasn't looking for a better city to live in. 
That means he wasn't looking for an upgraded house. I'm, listen, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. Upgrade your house, friend, if you can afford it. Put your crown molded. Get some new carpet. Buy a new car. Get leather seats if you can afford it. If you can't afford it, don't do all that because that's against the will of God. Because the word of God is clear on that. Live within your means, right? Oh, no man, no thing. But what I'm trying to say is this. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He was moving forward to the, to the prize, like the Apostle Paul said. I have not apprehended, yet I want to apprehend that which apprehended me. <laughs> Amen. And I press forward to the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's what we're to pursue. That's what we're supposed to be running after. He said, and, and Moses refused to enjoy the pleasures of sin just to be called Pharaoh's son. Wow. He refused to enjoy a season of the pleasures of sin just to be called Pharaoh's son. But instead, he suffered the reproach of Christ. That's, that's serious. Now, I mean, you think about that. See, see, right now, it's easy to be a Christian. Now, I'm telling you right now, it is easy peasy. <laughs> I don't know, we used to maybe say that when I was a kid. I don't even know what it means. It's easy to be a Christian in America. Yes, yeah. Now, I'm not saying that the devil doesn't attack us. I'm not saying that we're not in a spiritual warfare. That's not the part I'm talking about. There's nothing easy about spiritual warfare. There's no, but the cross of what Jesus has already done and the grace that flows gives us the strength. Amen. I'm talking about in the environment that we're living in. It's easy to live for Jesus compared to living in Syria. C compared to living in other places. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that Moses refused to enjoy the pleasures of sin. He refused to continue to live in Pharaoh's house once he realized that he wasn't one of them Egyptians and that he was actually a Hebrew and he made a choice to separate himself and to suffer the reproach of the Christ, which means the anointed one, because he knew that God had a plan. He moved himself out of the world and connected himself to the plan of God. God demands that his people call by his name be separate. He not, he's not preaching isolation. He's preaching separation. That's the whole thing what circumcision is about. That's the whole thing what the law was about. He's always demanding his people come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. What light, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Amen. That's, just, that's the truth of the gospel. And so if we're living in darkness and pretending that we're okay... Then, then, then we're, listen, we're deceiving ourselves. So it, where we did, where we went after that was we went into uh, Hebrews chapter 12 in the first few verses about the chastening of the Lord. He said, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. M many times we find ourselves being chastened and disciplined by the Lord. And, and, and sometimes whenever these things happen, and you listen, I don't have to repeat everything I said last week, but how you, when I ask this question, you think in your head what you think. How does the Lord chase those whom he loves? You know what I mean? You don't have to really answer. Somebody last week said tribulation. Correction. Huh? Correction. Huh? Correction. Correction. And, but how does it come in the real Tests, world? Tests, temptations. trials, temptations, sometimes painful circumstances. Yes. Right? Sometimes situations. You know, I keep reading in the proverb, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but sometimes the man will dig a pit and then he falls into it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Doesn't the proverb say that? He dug, a, he dug a pit and he fell into it. He fell into his own hole. And I don't know about you, but I know I've done that before. I dug a hole and I fell into the hole. It's like, why are you digging that hole, son? <laughs> because you're about to fall into it. And that's what happens some many times when the Lord is chastening us and bringing <laughs> discipline into our lives. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I know I've been there spiritually. That's just like a, a hailstorm. It's like I'm in the midst of tornadic activity, spiritually speaking, and nothing is really going right. And listen, sometimes I've been in, I believe, in the will of God. And I'm still experiencing chaos, but the grace of God is there to strengthen me and to empower me. And that's usually how you can tell the difference. Because I can remember one time, way a long time ago, I was sitting in somebody else's church. It's not important here. And I was sitting in the back of the church, and the preacher was preaching. And he said, if you're getting attacked 
by the devil, then you, you're in God's will. And I was sitting back there preaching. That ain't true because I just drank a, four, a quart of beer last night and looked at something I wasn't supposed to be looking at. So I know. So no. But what the, it was halfway true. It was halfway true that if you're moving towards the things of God, you likely are going to get attacked by, by the enemy. But the difference is, is that you're going to be able to feel the grace and the sustaining power of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life. And at the same time, if you're living in sin, and you know whether you're living in sin. And if you're and if you're not living in sin, then you don't feel you don't even feel bad right now. Right? You on the video. If you're live, if you're not living in sin, you don't even feel bad about me what I'm saying right now. But if you are living in sin, it probably makes you uncomfortable. Right? But but look, if you're living in sin and the enemy attacks, then the reason that you because you don't have the peace that you need. And that's usually a sign that something's not right. Because see, when there's grace, there's peace. There's a peace that surpasses understanding. That's right. Yeah. Amen. And it's a real, I want to keep moving with the text, but it's not really that hard if, if we have to move to repentance. The hardest thing is for the Lord to get us to bow our knee, I think, a lot of times. So the, he, the reason he chastens in love is because he wants us to receive the promises. So we see this cloud of witnesses that has gone before us that have separated themselves from the ways of the world so that they could grab a hold of and receive the promises of God. And so the Lord's chastening us to make sure that we also will receive those promises. God doesn't want you to miss out on the promises that he has for you. And he doesn't want me to miss out. Amen. So if you can put up there Hebrews chapter 12 and we'll start reading. Yeah, we'll read from verses 18 through 24 and do a little bit, maybe do a little bit of teaching in between. So he, so he starts to talk to them and he says this. The writer of Hebrews says, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. He's talking about back in the Exodus narrative. Whenever the Lord on Mount Sinai, whenever there was fire and there was smoke. And the Lord, you know, I went back a couple of chapters because I'm like, Lord, you, you pulled your people I didn't even know my microphone was going off. Y'all just laughing at me. I talked so loud, I didn't even need the mic. You turned me up. But Rich is over there. Let me hit this volume button. I'm like, Lord, why are you mad at him? You pulled him out of Egypt. Like, why are you making the fire, the, the mountain burn? Why are you blowing the trumpet? Why are you telling him not even to come close? But if you go back a couple of chapters, it's right after he brings them out of Egypt and he brings them to the first watering hole and there's no, there's no water, right? Or they, he brings them to a spot where there's no water and they start murmuring and complaining. And the Lord's already proven to them what he can do. And they're murmuring and complaining. So he's like, he's angry. He's like, you know what? They, don't, they cannot approach my holiness. They cannot approach my holiness. You better make a perimeter around this mountain because if they get too close and they touch it, then, the, the, then my fire is going to consume them. Okay. And, and, and as the Lord speaking, the people of Israel got to the point where they were like, Moses, please, you go meet with the Lord for us. You hear what he has to say. And then you come back and you talk to us because I, and Moses said, I, I was trembling, you know. There's a good thing to a good, healthy fear in all of God. As a matter of fact, the Lord gave me something a little bit different today. I was thinking, you know, I think I've worn out that whole justification blanket thing. So I'm not going to keep trying to go on and on about that. But justification is a beautiful truth in the scripture, meaning that you are justified by faith. Meaning if you get a revelation of that. I'll set you free yes. because like you walk, we walk around with condemnation and guilt so oftentimes and the enemy loves to keep that on top of us. Right. But, but and so if you get a revelation of what it means to be justified by faith because of what Christ has done, because he paid the penalty and that he's your righteousness and that, and that you truly understand that you, if you get a revelation of that, yeah. it needs to be a revelation of the Holy Spirit. It, it'll be it'll be like like a cloud of guilt is lifted yes. off of you that you realize that what Jesus did and there was an exchange that took place on the cross where the righteous one took your guilt upon him and he gave you his righteousness yes. 
And see, it's a gift, according to Romans 5, 17, the gift of righteousness was given. See, God the Father, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God the Father gave a gift, but Jesus gave you a gift too. Amen, I know I say this a lot, but Jesus gave a gift too. What did he give? He gave us his righteousness. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, the gift of righteousness. And so whenever, and whenever that goes from here to here, something very powerful happens. And you begin to feel the freedom and the liberty of the Lord. But look, justification by faith and a little bit of compromise without the fear of God turns into a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm telling you right now. Justific a revelation of justification by faith and then later down the line opening up the door to sin and thinking that it's not that big of a deal because you're justified and not having the fear and the awe of God still on the forefront of your mind as much as the word of God talks about is a bad place to be my friend because you'll think you're okay and your conscience isn't even receiving the conviction of the Holy Spirit and I'm here to tell you that there's a day coming when we will breathe our last breath here take our first breath there and we will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and we will give an account and like I was talking to somebody today I said it's just risky business not to be right with God do you understand what I'm getting? It is risky business. We put that stuff in the back of our head and we're like, oh yeah, but I got to. No, you don't have tomorrow. The word of God says no man is promised tomorrow. Multitudes in the valley of decision. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Praise God. And so they were fearful. Even if a beast touches it, it's going to be stoned, right? But look at verse 22. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion. Look, look at the wording. And to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable, uh, and to innumerable angels in a festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You know, some people would maybe think that that's Abel's blood speaking from the ground. But look, in, in Hebrews 11, 4, it said Abel had faith because he offered a better sacrifice than Cain. If you think about it, Abel is the first recording of another, of a man offering a blood sacrifice. Because, see, the first one that covered Adam and Eve was, had to be offered by God. Because they didn't even, they didn't even know what it was. And I'm not saying that Adam never offered a blood sacrifice. What I'm saying is, the best that I can see, Abel is the first recorded man to offer a blood sacrifice to the Lord. And the Lord received his offer. Amen? And, and so, but this is a better blood. Than so he was the first righteous man with faith to offer a blood sacrifice that was a type of the one that was to come. Amen? But now he's come. See, Jesus has come. And, and one of the things that I want to tell you when you read the book of Hebrews is this, is that you've got to understand the context. The, the letter to the Hebrews is actually written to Christians in Jerusalem. Christians, people that were Jewish by birth and Jewish in religion that had been converted to Christianity. And the whole context of the letter is to provoke them because they were starting to move backwards because of the great persecution. See, if you lived in Syria right now, you'd understand. If America stays the way that it is until the rapture of the church, then you'll never understand what the Hebrews went through. If America stays the same way until, the, until you get raptured out or until you go to be with the Lord. If America stays that way. But if America doesn't stay that way, then, then, then you and I may... One day, hopefully not, taste what the Hebrew Christians were tasting. And what they were tasting was persecution from their own families, persecution from the society around them, and, and they were shrinking backwards. They, they, were, they were preparing in their heart to go back to their old way of life. For them, it was back to the temple worship, back to the sacrificial system. See, they were going to turn their back on the blood of Jesus and they were going to go back to the sacrifices. Now, that's not you because you don't have any old sacrificial system to go back to. But what kind of life does the devil tempt you with whenever you find yourself 
under persecution, trial, and tribulation? What does he try to tempt you with that you would go backwards to? What, what, what old ways, right? But I want to talk to you a little bit about, about Zion. Let's just put up a couple of scriptures. One of them I used in my message on Sunday, but the first one, Psalm 48, 1 through 2. Now, let me just say this while they're getting to it. Psalm 48, verses 1 through 2. Zion is actually one of seven mountains with, in the area of Jerusalem. So it's a literal mountain or hill, if you will, called Zion. Okay, but when you look at the scriptures of the Old Testament, you realize that in God's mind, Zion has a greater meaning. Okay, he says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Anybody know who the city of our God is? You would call it Jerusalem, right? In the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of of the great king. Now, now the beauty of the story is if you go backwards in time, you realize that the presence of God was separated from the children of Israel for some quite some period of time, right? Because who was it? Hophni and Phineas took the ark and lost it to the Philistines and stayed at Obed Edom's house for a while. And then David, the king, goes and gets the ark, which represents the presence of God. Amen. And then he finally brings it into the city. Amen. And, 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 he, and, and, and it's connected to where the Temple Mount is located. It's, it, it's near there. But then what ends up happening is, is that the psalm is starting to give it another, an elevated look. Now Zion is being talked about the whole city, the city of the great king. And then when you see the city of the great king, you start to wonder, is he talking about David right there? I mean, if you read the scripture, I'm not hiding anything from you. You already know where we're, because David is just a type of the one that was to come. And so what this, what in God's mind what's being said is, is that great is our Lord, greatly. To, that's why whenever we walk in his house, we should be giving him the best that we have to offer. I'm, I'm just trying to make a point. I'm not trying to pick on nobody. I'm just saying the Lord is worthy to be praised. No matter how we feel, no matter what we're going through. Now, you know what I'm saying? Now, I realize we all praise the Lord differently. I'm not asking you to, to do anything that... But I'm, all I'm trying to say is, is that at the very least, we should be trying to make a heart connection with God. Does that, does that make sense what I'm saying? We should not come in here and be like, you know, I don't know. Let me not, let me not be obnoxious. But we should, we need to be careful that we're keeping our heart connected to the Lord. Is all, is all, because he's worthy of that. Yes. He's worthy to receive genuine praise from us considering all that he's done. So great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth. You know that's talking about Jesus right there. And, and, and then it says this, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. So some people say, well, that's why Jerusalem is so important. Hold on a second. Yeah, Jerusalem is important in the eyes of God. But we're so focused on the Jerusalem over there right now. We're not focusing on the Jerusalem that's right here. Because God's presence is not in an ark in Jerusalem right now. God's presence is on the inside of you. Amen? That's right. There's a trick. God's not done with Jerusalem. God's not done with Israel. I'm not... Preaching whatever that theology is that says God's done with the Jews. That's not what I'm preaching. I don't believe that. Because Jesus is going to sit on David's throne. That's what the scripture says. The, 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 the nations are going to come and pay tribute to him. And Israel will receive the glory that she was intended to have. But it's going to be because of Jesus. Not because of them. We put so much focus on Israel and, and the physical Jerusalem and pray for them. But they, listen, I keep saying this, but I'm going to say it again. There ain't going to be no peace in Jerusalem until the Prince of Peace comes back, my friend. So when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we really be praying that the Lord would return. Because I promise you, that, and, and as soon as they say peace and safety, huh, sudden destruction is going to come upon them. As soon as they sign whatever that peace treaty looks like. And by the way, anytime a man signs a peace treaty with Israel, your ears should be open and your eyes should be open. And I'll leave it like that tonight. Okay. All right. Look at number the second one. I want you to see Psalm chapter two, verse six. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. 
You know, and so that all goes back to these kings that are against God. We read that last week. But he said, I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So Zion literally, it's, it's, it's one mountain among seven, right? But this holy hill is taking on a whole nother level. It's, it's descriptive of the city itself. It's descriptive of what belongs to God. It's descriptive of where God is going to put his presence. Amen. And, it, and it's descriptive of the fact that he is declaring war against the forces of evil. Because if you go back and you read all of Psalm chapter two, and I know I read it Sunday, but he said the kings of the earth set themselves. The, the nations are coming together and taking counsel with one another against the Lord and his anointed. And they're trying to come against him and they're declaring war on God. But he said, but I have set my king upon this holy hill. And everything that the devil thinks that he's stolen and he's still trying to steal, I'm telling you right now, God is taking it back. And listen, the way that he's taking it back is he's looking for people like you and me. The days of thinking, I used to, I used to think that. I used to use this as a joke. I used to go to Cross and Place in Franklin. By the grace of God, I was already on fire for the Lord when I first started going there. But I used to say this sometimes whenever I preach. Uh, he'd give me a chance to preach every now and then on a Wednesday night. And I would try to provoke people to be witnesses for the Lord. And I would say, because I learned something, I can't shrink down Pastor Brad and stick him in my pocket. And then whenever he, and then whenever it's time, I throw him out there and pour a little water on him. Whoop, there he is. It doesn't work like that. The Lord wants to use you. He wants to use me. However, he can use us. And sometimes he uses some people a whole lot. And some people he uses them a little bit less. But sometimes quantity is better than quality. That's right. I mean, quality is better than quantity. Right? Sometimes sitting down with your friend and had a cup of coffee and really like, Amen. Giving them some Jesus is some good stuff. Amen. Amen. Because the whole world, if, if the whole world is under so much deception right now, my friend, even people that sit in Protestant churches, right? Just because the word of God is not really being exposed for the way that it's supposed to be. And many times believers aren't in the word of God the way that they're supposed that's to right. be. That, that's not a, that's not trying to be mean. That's just stating the facts. The word of God is so important mm -hmm. for our walk. And that's why I'll never apologize that we are we're really kind of a word church. I mean, I, I love worship. I'm telling you right now, I'll worship with the best of them. I love to worship the Lord. He's worthy of my praise and, my, and, and, you know, and for me to give him glory and honor. But the word of God. It, it helps us to really understand what God is doing. Amen. So he's working right now when we see all these things happening and, and we see the cloud of witnesses and the choices that they made. He's working his way from the temporary and the physical towards the spiritual and the eternal. And, and when he said that about the innumerable angels, y'all remember me saying that? The innumerable angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. He said, you're not going to the mountain that you could touch where there was trembling with fire and smoke and the trumpet and all that fear. No, you're going to the heavenly Zion. See, I want to, I want, that's a main point that I want to get across to you that we're given, we're given this great privilege. That's right. Church, it's a privilege. You, you do understand that. It's a, I, I, we need to really understand it. It's a privilege to have been called by God. It's a privilege to have been able to respond by God. And it is a privilege to work for God. Amen. It is absolutely a privilege. Now listen, you're looking at a guy that's been had the wrong attitude before as I've done the work of God in the past. But, but, but praise God, we got to learn how to see it and check it and repent for it. Praise God, because it is an absolute privilege to be partnered with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this work that, that he is doing. And going back to that inheritance thing that I said earlier, Ephesians 1.18 says this, that Paul prayed and prayed that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you would know the hope of his glory and the inheritance of the Lord in the saints. Dude, that is so powerful. Not only are you going to receive an inheritance, oh, you're going to receive an inheritance, my friend, if you endure until the end. Okay, you will receive an inheritance and you will receive a reward and it's going to be 
beautiful. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But you are the Lord's inheritance. You giving him glory and honor. Listen, and you know what? This is the thing. He wants more of us. <laughs> you get that? I don't know why he wants it, but he does. He wants more of us. The ones that he has, it ain't enough for him. He wants more. He did all this because God is love. And, and in order for God to be love, he's got to have something to love. And he don't just want something to love. He wants something to love him back. And listen, if we're going to be able to enter into, it just makes sense. If we're going to be able to enter into the eternal reward of God, then something has to happen on this earth that brings him glory. Your vessel has to bring him glory, church. Come, It just makes sense. What do we think that somebody said something to me today? It was so good. It, like Sometimes I wonder, like, and he would say it about himself at times in, his, in their life, but, but, and we've all been there. Sometimes I feel like an old jalopy. I don't know that he said the name jalopy, but an old jalopy, and there's the finish line, and this thing's puttering and gad, and it's like, and it looks like it's just, oh my God, is it going to stop right before I get to the line? You know what I'm talking about? You ever been in a place in your walk with God and it's just like, am I going to make it? Am I going to run out of gas? I don't know about you, but I don't want, no, I want to be like in a turbo shift Ferrari. Like, you know, throw that thing in the fifth or sixth or whatever they got. And boom, you know, just like fly through there. Lord, use me. Give me a turbo booster, something like that. Amen. Praise God. I want to be used by God. I want, to, I want to bring him glory. I want to bring more people to glory. That's really what I want to do. I want to bring more people to glory with me. I want to plant more seeds. I want to water more seeds. And I can't, listen, he's given me grace to do some of that. But look, do you imagine what we could get done if we actually had just even a small church like this, if all these seats were filled with people that were hungry to reach the lost, yeah. people that were willing to pray, to use their mouth, that God gave them to engage in, in warfare, to engage in prayer, to believe God, to use their mouth to speak forth the oracles of God, to use their feet to bring them to places where there's people hurting. You, could you imagine what could actually be accomplished with a group of people like that? Oh, man, it'd be a whole lot more amazing than 5,000 people that are just going to a church service just so that they can get whatever they want. Amen. Just doing their little, crunching their little clock and showing up and then leaving. You get what I'm saying? Does it sound like I'm mean when I say that? And no, good. I just want to make sure. But uh, praise God because it's true what I'm saying. I believe that. So the writer to the Hebrews is pleading with these believers not to quit. Don't quit. Don't turn back. Don't go back to your own way of life, right? Let's look at verse 25. Verses 25 through 29. It says, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape, so he's talking about those that were in the Old Testament during the, in the book of Exodus, in the wilderness, okay? He said, he said, if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Now, the immediate context, again, is the writer is pleading with the Hebrew Christians not to push away the voice of the Lord and to continue on the pathway that they're going back towards the sacrifices. That's the immediate context. But you got to understand that there's always a living principle that never dies. So for you and I, what he's saying is, he's saying, do not reject the voice of him who warns from heaven. Well, what is he warning us about? I don't know. That's each and every person in here's what you've got to determine. I have to determine it for myself. That's what the Holy Spirit is for. He's here to speak these things to us. Whenever a word like this goes forth, the Holy Spirit will speak to us. He's warning us from heaven. Amen. He's pleading with us. And he's merciful. He loves us. He's long-suffering. Amen. All right. He says, um, for if we reject him who warns from heaven, at that time his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised. Yet once more, now this is really what, what birthed this whole message. I didn't even tell you all this. This verse right here birthed this whole message for me. Okay. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. 
You, you get that. So listen, somebody, I can hear somebody that's a Bible nerd. I know we probably got a couple Bibles. Yeah, but Pastor Matt, he's talking about the whole world, the whole earth, and the whole heavens are going to be shaken up because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. Name it. The old heaven and the old the old earth is not going to make it into the next stage. Amen. But do you think that if he's going to cleanse that, he's not going to cleanse the human beings that are going in? You think that he's just going to let those jalopies just roll on through? You think that he's going to just let us kind of skip on through if he's over here been trying to warn us from heaven and we've been ignoring him? See, see if you haven't been ignoring him, you're happy right now. Yeah, you're like, you're in your spirit. You're like, preach it, brother. Preach it, brother. Or if there's some stuff that you're not feeling real convicted about, that's how you feel. Come on, brother. Keep on getting, bringing it. But if, but if you have it, then it gets uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> right? Amen. That's just the truth. So it goes on to say this, verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful. Oh, hallelujah. Isn't that good to be grateful? Thank you, Jesus. You know, let me just encourage you. Maybe some of you have been doing a whole lot. Of, you don't have a lot of prayer life. We've been really trying to push reading the word of God and prayer in this church. Sometimes I don't know how to start my prayers. But one thing I can promise you is this, is that if I'll start thanking the Lord. Oh, my God. He showed up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. That's what just happened. I don't even know if y'all were like, I just started thanking the Lord. Now, I don't know what it is felt like for you, but it felt really good for me to, 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 give him, to give him thankfulness. I'm just telling you, I'm about the Lord all over. I might have aggravated with you. I don't know, but it's okay because I was giving glory to the King. Amen. And so what I'm saying is, is that if we'll be grateful and we'll be thankful to him, uh, some amazing things will happen and you'll feel the prayer. It's a good way to start your prayers is what I wanted to say. Amen. Let's be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Praise God. Huh? And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship. The King James says, serve. Let us offer, to, but servanthood and life is worship. We've determined that in this church before, right? Worship is not a psalm service. We do understand that. That's right. Worship, worship it, a psalm service is a way that we can connect and worship God. But worship is a lifestyle. It's a servanthood. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. And so let us offer to God acceptable worship. Look at this. With reverence and awe. Yes. For our God is a consuming fire. Wow. wow. Offering him word, acceptable worship with reverence and awe. That word awe is something, man. I, and reverence. You know, reverence is important, child of God. Sometimes I feel like we've lacked that in our church a little bit. because, And, and I'm just being real with you. You know, and we're right. Somebody made the point a while back that we kind of have a small church, and it's true. I mean, we do have a small church. And so sometimes things are more more in the open in a small church. But I do want you to know that if you if you were in church, and some people are like, yeah, but churches are full of tradition. And yeah, but some of the traditions are good. Right. And, and being reverential in the presence of the Lord is a good thing. Yes. Because it's like you're respecting it. It's kind of like, look, if, if, if I don't know if you agree with this or not, but it's, it's kind of like, and listen, this is not go for people if you're hurt. If you can't stand up all the time, that's not what I'm trying to say. So please don't get offended if that's the case. I'm trying to make a point. And I'm going to try to make my face look like it so that you get the point I'm trying to make. It's kind of like if we come into the house of the Lord, if you could imagine that you were in, in, in an area and, and you were in a and a real king was coming, a king that you like, not right. maybe maybe not you know I don't know I'm not a Charlie, but you know I'm just saying like if it was a king that you liked and you felt like man this is our king dude like you know you're probably not gonna be sitting there like oh, man you know and I'm not saying that any of y'all like that when we're worshiping I'm trying to make a point you know it's gonna probably be more like. Man, the king, you know, like, and so, the, so what I'm trying to say is I'm pretty sure that we're asking the king to show up. Yeah. <laughs> and so if we're wanting the king to show up, it's a possibility that if we were giving him our best, whatever that looks like, then we were making that heart, can not a show. I don't want no church where people are just doing a bunch of show for worship. Right. No, I don't ever want to be a pastor of a church like that. I, no, I want, we want the real thing. Yeah. 
and, and, and we want Jesus to receive the real thing because he's worthy of the real thing. Right. So all I'm trying to say is that if we'll worship him out of in spirit and in truth and give him our heart, amen, I believe that it, it well, I know it, it pleases him. It's a, and it's a reverential thing. And so we should. And so if you see somebody talking, and now listen, if somebody whispers one little thing over while we're in the middle of worship, but if they're sitting there having this major conversation, I'm asking you, can you tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, please, do you mind? <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't say it like that. I know that would be like, dude, they're not coming back to church. Okay. <laughs> But now maybe you won't have to tap him on the shoulder now that I say that. No, really, like let's reverence the presence of the Lord. Amen. All right. So look at look at this though. Esau didn't worship and serve. Look, let's look at this. Hebrews chapter twelve, verses fourteen through seventeen. It says, "Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness." Springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Wow, that's big time stuff. It says a root of bitterness would, could spring up in you and, and by it many are defiled. You know that word defiled is in, in, if you look at one of the words that describes it in the, in the Greek dictionary, contaminated. That sounds scary to me. Yeah. I'm not trying to say I'm not trying to put something on it that it's not. I'm just saying it sounds scary to me to be contaminated. All right. So then it says this, uh, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. And the word profane means to be irreverent of the plan of God. Mm -hmm. So, so look, he's talking about fornication right here. And so we can't deny the fact that he probably has, he's got some physical concept of fornication in his mind here, but we also got to remember the immediate context. They're, they're being tempted to go back to temple worship. And so in a sense, if they leave Jesus and his blood, in a sense, they're committing not just fornication, adultery. but they're committing adultery. They're committed because they're married to Jesus. And I think we're, we're going to probably springboard into Romans 7 before long. And, and you can't be married to one and then try to have a relationship with another because that's 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 a that's adultery. You can't do that, right? And so what it says here though is that any fornicator or profane person as Esau, look, look what the rest of it says, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. I, I'm just telling you right now, that right there shook me up a little bit. Because look, if you take it past fornication and you really just think about what Esau did, see in reality, Esau never really owned the birthright. Because God promised it was going to go to Jacob anyway. But that's why. Because Esau sold that birthright for a bowl of beans. For like, and What we're talking about here is a carnal nature decision. He, okay, so you were famished because you were hunting. You, what it means is he had no desire whatsoever for the spiritual, the spiritual in life. He gave up his spirituality for a carnal decision, for the immediate. This looks good. This is what I want right now. I think it was last Sunday I said, I want cookie. Yes. And sometimes in our flesh, we want cookie because cookie is so good. But cookie is not good. It's going <laughs> to, for various reasons. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. The flesh want certain things. Right. But listen, if we're going to trade our spiritual inheritance for flesh, mm, this is what God says. It's a profane person. That's a, that's a profane, ir, a person that is irreverent of the plan of God for one morsel of meat, for one moment of opportunity, for one whatever it was, whatever people do, that whatever the little thing is, whatever. It started off in chapter 11, I believe, to sit, no, 12, seeing such a great cloud of witnesses as gone before us, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us. Lord, help us. Amen? I'm praying for the, the preachers preaching to himself. Lord, help us to lay aside those, those sins. And so look what it says. It says, for you know how afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. 
for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. That'll really shake you up right there. That'll really, now, it's a little bit better than that. So I don't want you walking out of here feeling, you know what I'm saying, all beat up and that there's no hope for you because that's not really what it's saying. See, there's two words for, there's two words for repentance in the Greek, at least two. One of them, this one here that, that, that they're using for Esau is the same one they spoke about Judas. Go to Matthew 27, verse 3. So in this one here, in Matthew 27, verse 3, it says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. So what you see is, is that he became sorrowful. He was sorrowful that it didn't work out the way that he had it planned. In his mind, he probably thought, if I do this, it's going to make Jesus. Like when he was in the garden, I mean, he was in the garden because he kissed Jesus, right? But when he was in the garden and he saw Jesus, whenever they said, whenever Jesus threw a Holy Spirit encounter, word of knowledge or discernment, he, they're all behind him. And he says, he knows they're there. And he says, whom do you see? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am in the Greek, ego, e am I. I am. <laughs> now I'll fall down on their face. And you think Judas would, yeah, I would imagine. I, this is my opinion. I can't prove it. I'm thinking Judas is probably, that's what I'm talking about. I've been trying to get you to come out to your shell. This whole time is about time we take our kingdom back. But, but that's not what happened. Jesus proved his power. And then he allowed them to tie him and bring him and to nail him to a cross because he knew. And so in the midst of that, Judas was sorrowful. Okay, but he did not change his mind. He did not truly repent of, of his sin. He did not truly get his heart right with God. He was sorry that, he, that his boo-boo didn't fix the problem. Okay, the same thing with Esau. Esau was sorrowful that he probably didn't have the blessing anymore. Right. But but he wasn't sorrowful to change his mind that he was concerned about the things of God enough to enough to move forward with God. All right. And and, and in Second Corinthians 710 and the, the uh, musicians, y'all can come forward. But I'm going to close with this scripture in Second Corinthians, chapter seven, verse 10. It says this for godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world work is death. Yes. You know, there's a big difference between the sorrow of the world. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry that this happened. And listen, I don't say that lightly because, listen, anything that can happen to somebody else can happen to me. Right? Amen. I mean, let's, 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 let's calm this down a little bit. Let's slow our roll. Let's make sure we're not getting too prideful. But I'm just trying to make a point that, that you know, uh, the sorrow of the world results in death, but godly sorrow will result yeah. in, uh, in repentance that will lead to salvation. Amen.